I just want to welcome everybody that's just joined. We're going to wait a minute or two just to make sure that everybody who's um, trying to join the link um, has a chance to join. Um, lots of people joining from different parts of the world. So we'll just give, the, uh, give, give a minute for everyone to, to catch up. So I'm going to start, um, good afternoon, um, good evening for those that are joining us from, from Pakistan. Um, my name is Imran Samuel. I am a barrister um, in London at Doughty Street Chambers. I'm a member of the executive committee of uh, the Bar Human Rights Committee. Um, what is the, the Bar Human Rights Committee, the BHRC? Well, we are the um, international arm of the the Bar of England and Wales and do um, all kinds of work uh, on human rights um, around the world, including trial observations, amicus curie briefs, which are interventions in cases, raising awareness about the plight of human rights lawyers in particular. Uh, we work with bar associations and, and organizations um, throughout the world. So that's who we are. And on behalf of my committee, I want to, to welcome everybody uh, to, this, to this webinar. Uh, we are delighted to be hosting this virtual panel event, bringing leading lawyers and civil society representatives to spotlight serious concerns about human rights violations and the rule of law in Pakistan. Um, my committee, the BHRC, we worked on human rights cases and projects in Pakistan for many, many years. In fact, as, as long as I, I can remember, um, in 2013, um, we uh, went to Pakistan and did a lot of work on the forced conversions, uh, predominantly of Hindu girls in, in parts of Sindh uh, and um, cases pertaining to that. Uh, we worked on the school syllabus at that time, which systematically discriminated against uh, minorities, um, leading to concerns about institutionalized prejudice. We've done a lot of work in the past on the blasphemy law and the, the climate of intimidation that many lawyers face when they um, are um, seeking to take on cases involving the blasphemy law. Um, and obviously the plight of the victims, the plight of victims who are in many cases shot outside uh, courtrooms before their cases ever come uh, to trial. Uh, in 2019, uh, we attended the Asma Jahangir conference in Lahore. Um, um, and uh, that was with myself and my uh, then chair of the BHRC, Shona Jolly and um, KC. So this panel today is the third in our Diminishing Democracy series, following uh, earlier rule of law um, events in part of this series. We've done an event on India in September 2021. We covered Sri Lanka in uh, October last year. And today's event on Pakistan will be followed by panel discussions on Myanmar and Bangladesh. So for those interested, please um, uh, keep an eye on your emails on, your, on our website for those up and coming events. In recent years, the BHRC, along with many, many um, human rights organizations, including Amnesty, and indeed the United Nations itself, have voiced serious concerns on the rule of law in Pakistan, including the crackdown on the freedom of expression and the press with the Pakistan Media Development Authority Ordinance, which grants the government unchecked powers to punish journalists. Civil society activism and dissent is being curtailed under arbitrary and punitive harassment and detention of journalists and lawyers and civil society representatives. We're going to cover much of that uh, today, including, as I mentioned earlier, the very controversial uh, blasphemy law and the, the Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which um, in, our, in our work, we found to be by far the most draconian um, across um, the world, across certainly across the Commonwealth. Freedom of religion continues to be undermined. Women, religious minorities, and LGBTQ communities continue to face violence and persecution. And we've got um, a, a lot of discussion that we can have on some of the, the current problems. Um, uh, uh, 
arising from, from that issue. We will also be touching on extrajudicial killings and crackdown on protesters, as well as enforced disappearance. I think the latest figures estimated well over 2,000 cases pending as of June last year in respect of enforced disappearances. Um, so you guys who have joined the session will have a, a brief outline of some of the things we're going to cover. I'm not going to go through all of that um, uh, uh, in my opening remarks, but what I would like to do is welcome uh, our absolutely incredible uh, panel. I'm really, really proud to welcome this distinguished panel, uh, both from the UK and Pakistan. We have Mr. Farooq Aftab. Um, he is a human rights activist. He's a lawyer. He's a news commentator. He's worked as a writer and a public speaker on global Islamic issues. Uh, Farouk is somebody who has worked for many, many years uh, raising the plight of the Ahmadiyya community um, in Pakistan and has advocated uh, for the betterment of the situation relating to that community. Someone I've had the pleasure of working with for many years and I'm really, really grateful he's um, found time to, to join us uh, from London today. We also have um, Jalila Heather, one of the leading human rights voices across Pakistan. She is a, an attorney, an activist. Um, she is the founder of We Are Humans Pakistan, a non-profit organization to lift communities by strengthening opportunities for vulnerable women and children. I hope Jalila won't mind me saying that. The last time I uh, did an event with Jalila was in 2019 in Lahore. And at that time she was named one of the BBC's top 100 influential women because of the incredible work that, that she's doing. She's a very, very brave um, lawyer fighting on the front line, particularly for, for women and young girls. Um, and in 2020, she was um, uh, awarded by the International, uh, International Women of Courage by the US State Department. Um, so absolutely wonderful to have Jalila with us, who's joining us uh, from Balochistan, I believe. We also have Saiful Maluk um, joining us from, from, from Lahore. Saif is a, a leading human rights attorney in Pakistan. He has done the leading cases on international freedom uh, in Pakistan, including famously um, prosecuting Mumtaz Qadri, the man who assassinated governor of Punjab, Salman Taseer. Saif successfully represented Christian woman Asia Bibi on death row, whose case became symbolic of the struggle of Pakistan's Christians under the minority law. Uh, he has, it's at, from that point onwards, continued to work on the issue. Many people in his position who have been threatened may, might want to find some other line of work to do, but SAFE remains intimidated on the front line and is uh, joining us today. So I'm very, very grateful um, to these three individuals and making an absolutely incredible panel. Um, uh, today. So that's enough for me because we've got some real experts that uh, I'm sure you'd much rather hear from and leave plenty of time for your questions, both from the UK and, and from Pakistan. I'm going to ask Saif to kick us off. Um, Saif Ulmulat from Lahore. Thank you so much, Saif. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for joining us and I'll give you the floor. And, and Saif, please you, uh, don't forget to unmute your microphone because I always forget. So I'll Hello, friend, all around. <clears throat> uh, as far as uh, Pakistan's uh, blasphemy laws are concerned, I mean, this is, uh, this is, I would say, such a loss. We, I mean, to even, we as the courts, or we as the police, or we as the government, or we as the society, Overall, that these uh, implement these laws in true perspective, and saying this means you are asking for your death. You are going to represent a victim of blasphemy, in particular in trial courts, and you are asking for your own life to lose. I mean, usually in the trial courts, as I've experienced over many, many years, there are gangs of lawyers who are coming from the prosecution sides, 30, 40 in number, in one go before a trial judge. Trial judge looks a hostage, not a judge. 
putting his face down and unable to control his coat. And the defense lawyer, he's being physically maltreated by all these uh, group members. And he's not allowed to as independently cross-examine the witnesses of the prosecution. And I think calling this a fair trial as we have newly inserted in our constitution one article and the legislature and the government and even our spear courts are trying to take pride of article 10a, right to fair trial. I say what to talk of right to fair trial as a fundamental right before the trial courts in blasphemy cases, you have no right as an accused. And as a defense lawyer, you are treated as co-accused. You're not treated as a lawyer. It will be maybe a news for the world to know that all these people who are coming from the prosecution side I have tried many a time to say hello, good morning, good afternoon, and they never say good morning, they never reply. They, they look at you like uh, enemy, one who has killed the fathers and forefathers as a personal enemy. So in this situation, talking about the human rights in Pakistan, I say fundamental rights are at the much higher pedestal because our constitution says, Article 8, that uh, legislature is not entitled to make laws which goes against the fundamental rights. So they, the protection to the fundamental rights are given in the constitution and the parliament is stopped to enact against the fundamental rights. But when you go in practice, you see on the grounds, there's absolutely no fundamental rights. Fundamental rights are, there are two classes, haves and have nots. Those who have, courts are with them, police is with them, parliament is with them, society is with them, everybody is with them. Those who falls in the not haves categories, they have nothing. A few days back, I think uh, three days back, the I think unfortunately, um We've lost the um, connection with SAFE. Um, it might be it might be something in relation to the um, internet connection. SAFE's obviously joining us from um, Lahore, uh, where um, power cuts are, are sometimes frequent. Um, so we, we will uh, obviously return to SAFE when he's able to to to, to, to rejoin. I can see he's he's, he's attempting that now. Safe. Um, if you unmute yourself, thank you. Welcome back. Some, somebody just connected for a phone call. So coming back. So I was saying what to talk about the human rights in Pakistan as far as when it comes to the blasphemy accused and their investigation and their trial and to represent them which is uh, the fundamental rights which are granted in the constitution, you don't see on the ground, neither in the trial court, nor in the high court, even in the Supreme Court, they minus one or two judges in total number of 17, the rest are also behaving the same way as the normal people are behaving. Now I was quoting that the three, four days earlier, a man was arrested in Punjab, in the Nankana district, with the allegation that he has uh, uh, done something with Holy Quran. 
and police arrested him, brought him to the police station. And the mob came, took him from the police station, from the police custody with force, brought him out of the police station. In front of the police station, they killed him to death. And neither that police officer who was in charge of the police station, who was in charge of the district, who was in charge of the area, I say all of them should have been booked for uh, murder of this man. Who, because he was in the state custody. So you arrest the people, then you let the, this uh, mob enter to the police station and kill them. I mean, this is the situation. And first time, I really got frightened. I said, if this is the situation, you know, when Mumtaz Qadri's last appeal came before the Supreme Court of Pakistan, one of the senior most judge of the Lahore High Court, Mia Nazir Akhtar, who was next to the Chief Justice, he retired, he represented him before the Supreme Court. And you read the judgment, he's arguing. He said, even if I was there, and I could have seen somebody, Salman Taseer, saying something in dis disrespect of the Prophet Muhammad. I could have also killed him. This is, he stated before, full bench of the Supreme Court. And I had the objection with the Supreme Court that, that why they didn't issue a notice, that why your lesson should not be, uh, your name should not be removed from the rules of the Supreme Court. I mean, this is the situation. Tolerance, intolerance has gone to a level, I can't tell you. Same happened in Pishar, you know, a year back, when an MD person who was uh, alleged to have committed some blasphemic act, he was killed in custody. And I mean, it's hopeless. I'm talking about you are holding a seminar on human rights in Pakistan. I say human rights come much, much after the fundamental rights. When I read the constitution, you have right to life, you have right to property, you have right to dignity. So after 40 years practicing here, I could never find any of the fundamental rights prevailing in the society. And what I've seen is, it is the powerful. If you are from the elite class, you're from the judges, you're from the military, you're from the elite political class, you're from the industrialist class, you are the kings. I mean, no law can catch you. No court can ask you. No police can ask you. But if you are from the people class, which are 90% of the society, then you are just living in a jungle. If you can survive, it's your good luck. If you can't survive, state has state is not ready to take any responsibility. So then the question was, the rule of law, there is no rule of law. I would say, the and then our constitution say equality of the citizen before the law article 25 one of the fundamental right i say a man who killed 10 persons he's tried under section 302 and he's sentenced to death and man who is alleged for a blasphemy he has killed nobody and he sentenced to death. The man who has killed 10 person, he's a very respectable in the prison. His, every lawyer can represent him. Every judge will hear his case. But when it comes to the blasphemy convict, no lawyer would like to go for his defense because uh, he will be having his own life destroying. And no judge is ready to hear his appeal because they say, why we should disturb our family life? So where goes the equality class? Then 
there is an article 4 in our constitution which says the it is an inalienable rights of every citizen to be treated in accordance with law so when it comes to these best family laws when it comes to these amadis when it comes to the other religious minorities i would say the inalienable right is disappear it's no better so i think as far as uh, i am concerned i have seen the after 1985 when this 295c was uh, introduced in the parliament by the then dictator general ziaul haq to please the mullah of this country thereafter our society has totally i think gone mad I mean, anybody can catch you anybody can kill you that you are not a good muslim you have done something against islam or with any allegation anything can be done to you prior to that pakistan was a entirely different country i had seen in 70s girls moving in t-shirts happy having uh, wearing skirts jeans and, but after that zaul haq's regime the society i think you can't you don't don't give you a space to breathe even and i think now for uh, men like me when this man was killed from the police station outside on the gate from the police custody i first time was seriously thinking that uh, if i want to live few years as a free man i should leave this country and never thought i was many a time offered by many countries that i should uh, leave i should leave and then no many people need me here many people need me here but after this incident i really got right i mean this is the situation and so i would say that uh, the bless family they have no constitutional right they have no fundamental right they have no human rights and no judge no court no investigator the police is ready to write what is the truth but everybody goes with the mob and mob wants death of all such people to whom the acquisition is made on so that is all um, thank you very very much um safe very um chilling scary to listen to your observations after four decades of uh, of practice and I, i'm very grateful um, very 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 brave man i'm not sure i know anyone else who would take on the briefs that you've taken on and continue to do so and thank you so much for for sharing your thoughts um so i'm going to move from lahore punjab to quetta balochistan uh, where we have um jalila heather waiting for us and uh, as i said before uh, uh, the leading human rights voice in balochistan we're very grateful that she's joining us thank you jalila thank you uh, uh i'd like to add uh, with uh, saif saab just uh, sorry mr saif uh, just uh, want to give two reference that uh, yesterday a member of parliament a political activist of fata who was charged uh, under sedition and so many other anti state activities just because he wanted to Uh, you know rights of his people he just got released after a huge procedure of uh, you know got his release order even though he got bail uh, a month ago so this is how the level of our prosecution and rule of law is happening in our country and today uh, the parents of the deceased uh, gulala ismail 
they are acquitted from the charges of sedition after continuous uh, three years of trial that they were facing in front of the uh, uh, Peshawar uh, Anti-Terrorism Court. So uh, when we come and talk about human rights, rule of law, fundamental uh, rights, so uh, in the current situation of Pakistan, I can't give any reference as Saif, Mr. Saif mentioned because he has more experience than me, but in my lifetime as a lawyer, as an individual, as a citizen of this country and belonging from an ethnic minority in the other part of Pakistan, like Balochistan. So uh, I have seen there is no human rights, there is no constitution, might is right, anyone who can, who have power, who, who shares power, who agrees to share uh, power. All these people are privileged to get justice, to have uh, dignity in the society, to have a uh, right to uh, freedom of expression, freedom of, uh, you know, speech. Even uh, the rest of Pakistan, I have never seen. I just want, I don't want to um, uh, repeat whatever is Mr. Saif have mentioned, but the issue of the lawyers, even in the cases of the enforced disappearances are not uh, as different as uh, the cases of uh, blasphemy laws, that those lawyers who take up the cases for to ensure the right of your trial of an individual, they also face uh, the same uh, situation in Balochistan, like you have been uh, named. Uh, I, I personally experienced it. You have been named and taken as anti-state. You are uh, named as the terrorist uh, apologist. You are named as the tagged as the uh, terrorist uh, sympathizer. Sometimes they try to, they means our state, try to associate you with some banned organizations. You have under complete uh, scrutiny of the state. In case of blasphemy, you are uh, in the hands of uh, you know mobs and individuals, a group of people. But what uh, 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 when we look into the voices from Balochistan or the lawyers who are uh, uh, fighting for the rights of the people, they are. Uh, uh, completely under the surveillance of the state. Their phones are being taped. I myself have been arrested twice. My name was placed in exit control list. Uh, while uh, going to UK twice, I was arrested at the airport and um, uh, without any allegation, without any charge against me. And just to give a tough time to the activists, dissenting voices not to since we uh, our country our state affect us that we always talk about the positive image of the country if if there is someone you know a dead body of someone being a person who is being killed it is good for our state that we we should present a positive narrative in the situation that we say oh this person is acting as a dead he's a good actor. So this is how the narrative of the positive image inside our country is nurturing and damaged the en entire uh, uh, society as whole. Well. Every individual is a court, every mob is a judge, and they decide the fate of the people. When your state does something like extrajudicial killings of the political activists, either it is Baloch, either it is uh, other groups of uh, people who wants their rights, who question state's policies. So if they start, you know, doing extrajudicial killing. So in case of uh, uh, blasphemy law, we see that the same is being replicated by the group of individuals in the form of the um, uh, in the form of a mob lynching that people take laws in their hands. Since there is no accountability of any institution, any uh, any institution, including judges, including uh, politicians, politicians somehow they have some accountability, but in case of the military uh, or our deep state, there is no accountability, whatever they are doing with the fate of the country, so nobody cares. Uh, coming to... Uh, the writ of the state, my, uh, my uh, analysis uh, working in a conflict zone, living as an ethnic minority in a Gito or 
ghetto sized area. I personally feel that since our country is uh, has spent a lot, invested a lot to militarize its civilians for Afghan jihad, for uh, for you know, for uh, our uh, foreign policies, uh, we can see that now every person is militarized. If they don't find anyone to kill, they kill their women inside the house because everyone is equipped uh, with guns. They 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 have this militarized mindset that they they. They take it out on the, the their fellow citizens because they need someone to kill because their minds have become militarized. So the investment that we did in past 40 years, we are paying for this. When we, in past few weeks, I see there are so many uh, attacks on the Ahmadiyya community's dorms and their mosques. They are not allowed to offer their prayers even uh, uh, in all these situations. We see that uh, I state is I personally feel that the state shouldn't have any religion. I state should be neutral. But in in the case of Pakistan, we have a religious state which determines that who is minority, who is majority. It is institutionalized. It is written in our constitution that uh, who who should be means like their state shouldn't be responsible to determine people's faith that who is Muslim. Muslim who is non-Muslim, but in case of Ahmadiyya, we see it is institutionalized. It is written in our constitution that they are non-Muslim and give, it gives authority to the rest of the people that do whatever you do. The same we see with the blasphemy cases. So everyone believes that he is a pure Muslim and everyone has this faith that I am the right person. So he feels that he because it is now a, a big it is becoming a question of the faith and you know uh we call it uh uh, a crucial type thing that any person who kill a blasphemous means like uh, they will go to Jannah or they will be in charge of something. So when we look into uh, replicate into this, so initially we see there are militarized groups that for our, our deep states for time to time have nurtured these people and uh, for their politics like TLP, we can see TLP has emerged in 2014, uh, empowered in 17 and being used now and it is like a monster in this society. So when we see this Barelvi school of thought in past, they were less radicalized as compared to Wahhabi school of thought. But when they saw that violence has power, because they saw that Wahhabi school of thought are having control over uh, with power and violence, they are getting good control on the different uh, uh, parts of the country and rest of the world with the concept of the fear. So they also have switched to it. And the same will, of course, if Shias in future will feel the same, so they will also be violent. But the political use of religion is that much in our country that now it is doomed. It is like we cannot breathe. We, we feel afraid of our fellow citizens. We cannot talk rational things. Like we cannot argue. If any person give us any narrative, we should have to agree with him. We With her, we, we cannot say no. It is logically, it's not like this. It is that because they have blocked the ideology of rationality, the scientific approach in the country. There is no logic. So in all this situation, as Saif Saab, our lawyers, our judges, our police, our uh, everything, this mindset is flourishing in our every institution. In, in our streets, in our houses, in our circles. And that is why I personally feel that there is no rule of law. There is no fear of uh, writ of state. There is no control over them because our uh, 
indirectly or instead nurtured these people. Sorry to say, but when when extrajudicial killings starts from the state side, so of course citizen will behave in the same manner. So if if they follow rule of law, if they follow constitution, if they remain within the ambit of constitution, so no one dare to unfollow these things. So that is my take on this and uh, 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 thank you. Jalila, thank you so, so much um, for sharing with us the perspective from uh, Balochistan, including your own personal struggle on the front line and, and being arrested, uh, I think you said twice. Um, I was very, very grateful for, for, for listening to your observations. And um, it does seem to my mind, from everything that Saif and Jalila have said so far, that um, a, a bad picture is getting much worse. Um, but let's turn now to Farouk. I know um, we've touched on the Ahmadiyya community. Jalila mentioned the incidents recently with um, Ahmadiyya mosques being targeted, but we have a real expert um, today who's um, worked on th this issue for many, many years, and it's a real honor to be able to hear from Farouk Aftab next. Thank you, Farouk. Thanks, Imran. I'll give a very brief background to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as many may not be aware of the community itself, focus on current issues and touch upon some of the solutions uh, in the allocated time. So who are the Ahmadis? They consider themselves to be Muslims, follow the tenets of Islam, believe in the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. But where they differ is, they believe that the Messiah awaited by all world religions has arrived. Due to this theological difference, they are persecuted. However, we're not here for a theological debate and it's irrelevant from a human rights perspective. I mean, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is really facing an existential threat. And it's perhaps the most persecuted religious group, in Pakistan, in the world today. They suffer a unique combination of virulent media commentary, violence, and hatred, active state repression through specific anti Ahmadi laws, and passive state tolerance of violence against Ahmadi Muslims. Some of this has been touched upon by the previous speakers. It's a toxic combination which makes everyday life impossible and prevents any form of meaningful communal worship. Threats and violence and death are just part of everyday life for Ahmadis in Pakistan. This wasn't always the case. Ahmadis weren't always persecuted in Pakistan. They were instrumental in the foundation of Pakistan with the first foreign minister, Sir Zafrullah Khan, being an Ahmadi, first Muslim Nobel laureate, Professor Abdul Salam, also being an Ahmadi. But in 1974, the Pakistani government introduced a constitutional amendment which declared Ahmadis, whom it refers to using the derogatory term Qadianis as non-Muslims. In 1984, it went further. It adopted a legal ordinance, the infamous Ordinance 20, which made it a criminal offence for Ahmadis to refer to themselves as Muslims, which, is, which itself is contrary to Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the 1981 United Nations Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based on Religion and Belief. Though other minorities are targeted, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the only community which is specifically targeted by state legislation through this infamous, infamous Ordinance 20, or known as the anti ahmadiyya Laws. It's beyond dispute that the ordinance violates the basic rights of Ahmadiyya Muslims to freedom of religion, which is an absolute right as guaranteed by international law. Consequently, many Ahmadis have lost, amongst other rights, the fundamental right to vote, more importantly, the right to adopt the religion of their choice. Their daily lives have been unbearable through this ordinance. At every level, be it governmental level, judicial, civic, or through commerce, they face discrimination and harassment, topped off with ever increasing threats of criminal sanctions due to their religious beliefs. Many incidents go unreported. The police often blame the victim and approaching them for help, just risk prosecution under the anti amadi laws. And this is something that Saif has also alluded to generally for all, all minorities. What results is a climate of constant and sustained persecution for Ahmadi Muslims, who as a result of their faith are totally excluded from Pakistan's mainstream society. Since the Lahore, Lahore attacks in 2010, when 86 Ahmadi Muslims were murdered and hundreds were wounded, the situation has only got worse. 
Even in death, Ahmadis are not safe. And the basic respect which is ex expected to be afforded to the deceased is disregarded. For the past many years, the state has now started registering cases against Ahmadis under Section 295, defiling the Holy Quran, or Section 295C, defiling, defiling the name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And anti-terrorism laws have also been used most recently for registering these cases, which is due to the religious intolerance against Ahmadis. As I mentioned, anti-terror laws have been used. Also, cyber laws have been on the rise recently. The Pakistan Telecommunication Authority has issued notices to Ahmadis, not just in Pakistan, but in places like the USA, UK, Australia, and other countries with the threat of criminal prosecution, demanding that they, sh they shut down their Ahmadiyya websites because they go against Pakistani law. It's also pressured Google to take down the Ahmadiyya Muslim Quran app developed outside of Pakistan. Initially, it was unsuccessful, but the PTA then threatened to block Google completely in Pakistan, and the app has now been removed in Pakistan from the Pakistan server. The desecration of Ahmadi places of worship and attacks on private houses of Ahmadis is a recurrent phenomenon and is also on the rise. In the past few months, clerics have called out on supporters to carry out attacks against pregnant Ahmadi Muslim mothers to quote, to ensure that no new Ahmadis are born and those babies who are being born should be killed. There's just no limit to this persecution which has led many to leave Pakistan and seek a safe haven in other parts of the world. But at the same time, the persecution has also spread to other countries, including the West. Only a few weeks ago, nine Ahmadis were brutally murdered at gunpoint in Burkina Faso. It's a very difficult situation, but some practical steps possibly could be taken in Pakistan in the short term. Um, these include, for example, number one, looking at Focusing on citizenship, the rights of all citizens should be equal or before the law. They should all have the right to vote. We should abolish the separate list, which Ahmadis are on, and ensure all citizens have the equal right to vote, regardless of the religious or non-religious beliefs. Two, stop the use of anti-terror laws, which should not be used against Ahmadis or other religious or ethnic minorities, and their literature should not be classified as hate literature for these purposes. Three, release all Ahmadis kept in prison under the blasphemy laws or anti-terror legislation. And these laws that focus on Ahmadis, they should be removed. Four, return the nationalized schools and colleges of Ahmadis, which is a straightforward thing. It's in line with the government's own policies and it has returned it to other, other communities and other minorities. In the end, what I would say is that the escalating and persistent human rights violations against Ahmadi Muslims has now reached a critical point and possibly bordering on genocide. The persecution of Ahmadis often leads to the persecution of other minorities, such as Christians, Hindus, others. Ahmadis are seen as a litmus test for human rights in Pakistan. They've been suffering in silence for no reason other than professing to be Muslims, with little attention being given to their plight by the international community. From cradle to grave, Ahmadis are not spared, from children being denied access to education, to digital and cyber laws being used against them, to not having the right to vote, to their identification documents, such as passports being marked, which is reminiscent of the Nuremberg laws. Ahmadi women are even more affected. As I mentioned earlier, the past few months, there have been nearly daily incidents from Ahmadi graves and places of worship being vandalized to senior members of the Ahmadiyya leadership being targeted. We all know genocide does not happen overnight, or without warning. And we have seen tragedies in human history repeating due to our failure to take timely action, or our silence when faced with buildup of human rights violations, bigotry, hatred, and division. The Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan is facing pot potential systematic genocide. The long-standing targeted and regressive laws, coupled with pandering to demands of religious extremists, is a path that ultimately leads towards genocide and benefits no one, benefits no community, no minority. It's high time that the international community and others intervened to stop and prevent the current escalation of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Pakistan. Thank you. Farooq, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the, for the incredible work 
um, that you've done over su such a long period of time and your candid um, remarks um, that you've shared with us, including the, the very practical steps and recommendations for trying to make things a, a little bit better. Um, one of the great things, although this is a um, rather um, depressing subject uh, uh, for obvious reasons, one of the, the, the positives that we can take from some sessions like this is connecting um, people together and working out ways to support each other. And I'm hoping that some of the discussion that we're going to have now with our audience will help help facilitate a part of that. Um, so um, we're now going to move to um, a Q&A session. These questions are, are not from me. They are um, being um, sent um, as we speak from, from um, people listening. Um, so as we go on, please do send in your questions. Um, I'm going to begin by a question that's been um, uh, raised, I think, by uh, Marina Wheeler Casey, a barrister uh, in, in London, and she says that SAFE's description, this is addressed, I think, to you, SAFE, um, your description about the situation is um, shocking and bleak, and it sounds like it doesn't really matter who holds power, it doesn't matter which party is in power, because there's no commitment to ordinary people. And I, th I think the question is, what can be done positively? Uh, you guys are brave lawyers and you take personal risks, but what meaningful support and solidarity can we offer um, from the offices that we hold in London? And say, for, uh, uh, you have to unmute yourself, please. It's okay. okay. I say, it has to be done within Pakistan. It, outside Pakistan, it, there is no solution. I say, when one uh, the Sri Lankan man was being uh, killed in a factory in Sialkot last year, and I was the one man in the country, I said, please prosecute the district police officer, district uh, commissioner, and all the institution, including the factory owner. Why? Because since morning, they, my, the speakers in the mosque were going on that uh, is a man who's uh, committing blasphemy, and people were coming to the factory, normal public, mob and nobody was stopping them. So I say all these were the part and parcel of the murder. Now this recent, I told you three days earlier, from police station, they took the accused out and killed him uh, with their uh, sticks and uh, beatings and all that. I say, who is the responsible? It is the police who has arrested him and gave it to those people to kill him. And I said to save one man's life from the mob, it is much better the state should kill 100 people to save one man. So that in future, everyone knows that anybody who comes to kill somebody who is in the custody of state, state won't care if they have to kill 100, 500, or as many as to save that one man, so that is the rate of the law. I say that is probably the solution. Then the political party of Pakistan and military of Pakistan has to decide now, it is time now, that no blackmailing, whether the vote of the right wing or the extreme Muslim comes to which party or the, if military needs to use these uh, TLP and all that uh, right wingers for their own sometime political purposes, we have to make the CN the no. We all will stand by the state. We all will stand by the constitution and military, all politician, all political party, all intelligentsia of this country should stand by the constitution and by the rule of the law and by the equality class. I think that is, I think, what the solution is.
und die You are mute. No, it's okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I have a question um, that's been asked by somebody called um, Nilmini Rollins, uh, and it's a question for Farouk. Farouk, um, what are the implications of using anti terror laws against Emidies? I think we're all, we're all doing it now, Farouk. That you have to unmute yourself. Well, there you are. Yeah, after the same thing. Yeah, I was just saying it's building on the blasphemy laws. It's another excuse to go after minorities. Um, so, I mean, the anti terror laws and most recently cyber laws are being used more extensively in the past few years against Ahmadis. We've been seeing that and it's, it's not helping. It's also being used against other minorities, but it's, not, it's another way of squeezing, I mean, particularly the Ahmadiyya Muslim community on the pretense of anti terror laws particularly banning their hate material, banning their literature under the, under the pretense of hate material, when the anti-terror laws are designed for something completely else. Thank you, Farouk. I will have a question um, from a lawyer in London, Shoaib Khan. There, are, there were reports yesterday about a member of the public being jailed for tweets critical of the, the army, the establishment. Do we know anything more about um, the circumstances of that case. I wonder if any uh, um, of our speakers are aware of that case. Yeah, that is very interesting that a young boy who tweeted, uh, I think uh, he is from PTI, Pakistan Tehrik Insaf, and he is fined and three years jail. And that is for just tweet and, uh, you know, questioning the uh, uh, military role in democracy. I think uh, that is so unfortunate that the law, which has been passed by the pa Pakistan Tehrik Insaf itself uh, for the protection of the dignity of the army and institutions, they are using the same law against the um, supporters of Pakistan Tehrik Insaf that is condemnable. I think freedom of expression is everybody's right. Everyone has, uh, um, uh, there is no holy cow, holy only Allah Almighty, according to we Muslims. So there is no one holy that uh, no one can criticize them. No one uh, should criticize uh, anyone on their political interference. I think this is this is something that which is not fixing our uh, country. We see even in the political scenario, our political parties during their election campaigns, either uh, right wing, left wing, secular, they always use uh, the card, blasphemy law, and as well as um, anti ahmadiyya uh, you know, uh, uh, thing as a reference whenever they want to get, uh, uh, do their election campaigns. So these all are like, no, the problem is basically political. And uh, I, I would like to agree with Saif as well, that it should be fixed politically within Pakistan and only Pakistani think tanks, those who have rational thoughts, logical people, they should come forward, take the lead and should not tolerate anyone who, who persecute, who execute, who, 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 uh, who discriminate people on the grounds of their gender, faith, ideology, uh, class, anything. So this is a utopian approach, but still we, we, we expect that somehow it is within Pakistan that can be resolved uh, and our, you know, politicians, our institutions, our law enforcing agencies, our judiciary interpretation of law, these all should be replicated for the rights of the people. Not It should not go against the people, against the the norms of the constitution, though I have some reservations for the constitution as well, but anyhow, still it is existing, so it should be uh, implemented, so somehow people can get relieved uh, from this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm having questions being sent in um, uh, thick and fast now. Before I move on, does anyone else want to come back on that particular one? Um, Safe, I, th I think you're um, still unmuted. Sorry, muted, I mean. No. Thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Even in the Pakistani constitution, 
the parliament is not allowed to talk against the army and the judiciary in the parliament through they can't debate on this so i think there's a lot of protection to these two institution the army and the judiciary and i think uh, we can just talk but uh, as far as that uh, what will happen when it will go all right not in my life at least maybe in your life so safe um thank you don't unmute don't mute yourself just now because i think the next question uh, is a best sent uh, 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 best placed for you uh, in it's in regarding a, a, a young man called stephen massey who is certified as bipolar and has have been charged with um blasphemy and i think he was bailed but the uh, a death sentence still is over his head are you aware of that case um safe and are you able to to, to comment on its progression what name you told me steven massey steven massey yes steven massey i think is from shalpo and uh, he's now in the mental sick hospital lahore probably is it declared by the doctors under the pakistan criminal procedure code there's a provision section 465 that uh, if doctor give an opinion that man man is unfit to face the trial he can't understand so his trial is uh, being postponed and it is being put in bed till the doctors uh, declare in fact I, i think it's that case probably yeah, it's it, it it sounds like that one safe and are you saying that there are medical grounds on which he might may be acquitted uh not acquitted the supreme court uh, five judges had uh, given a judgment in 2018 safia bb's case where they have held that uh, if it is proved that somebody has gone uh, deranged mentally even after he sentenced to death in any case he cannot be executed he cannot be hanged once he is mentally declared sick and secondly they say if the man was sick at the time of commission of the offense this is also provided in the pakistan penal code from one of the exception that if you are not in your fully senses you cannot be tried for any offense um thank you saif um the next question i think um is is, is something really for um the whole panel um, and um there might be some people that feel more um comfortable at answering th than others um what is the solution to the, uh, I mean, the the all sorts of discriminatory laws that we've discussed today and problems but the blasphemy law keeps coming back it's something which goes across many of these issues and is misused in so many ways um if the solution lies in pakistan rather than um pressure necessarily from the international community by itself um the question is we can't get rid of the radicals we can't uh, uh, necessarily realistically lobby for changing the legislation so where does the immediate solution lie i wonder if i could ask farooq and then saif and then jalila uh okay me yes please uh once i was sitting in the state department washington and this question was asked to me which you are asking now i said there's a very, very simple solution um you said what is that i said uh, call the chief of army staff for pakistan and tell him to take over the government with the pre condition that he'll change uh, annul these laws when he take over first order would be annulling all these laws they stood up some said we can't do it i said if you can't do it then it will continue so i think that is the answer nobody can do it. you are mute imran <laughs> 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 
Farouk, if you have anything to add to, to what Saif has said? Yeah, I think it's very difficult now because the state has created a situation where the clerics will have the street power, mob power. It's very difficult to eliminate that unless you know you really bring in individuals who want to change things. But you know, from our experience, yeah, we, we would say that touching the blasphemy laws at the moment wouldn't make sense. It's a long-term aspiration, but we should go you know step by step and focus more on lower hanging fruit, maybe rights like citizenship where it's more palatable maybe to the government and the clerics to bring people as citizens of Pakistan and to focus on human dignity and those rights. That may slowly, slowly bring some change and lead, but it's going to be a long-term process. As I said at the moment, it, you know, the, it's out of the hands of the government with the street power created by the clerics and the mobs. Jilly, let's uh, 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 we often hear sometimes where international help can um, can assist and sometimes be counterproductive. What's what's your views on the solution to, to, to the, the really the blasphemy law in particular? I think uh, I think I'm a Democrat, so I don't look into another forces, either outsider or anyone who take over the country and decide uh, where, uh, inside the uh, I know it is uh, safe. Mr. Saif mentioned it in a say, you know a sarcastic manner. I think the true core of the uh, core of, uh, 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 the true soul of democracy should be enforced in the country. It should be the people of Pakistan through a education, through uh, discussion, through a uh, campaign on diversity, tolerance, respect towards each other, equal citizenship should be promoted. And there should be a, a, a strong rule of law. I agree that uh, with Saif that there should be prosecution of those who are in power when such incidents happens in their areas uh, against the minorities. So the, they, they should not only suspend the DPO or DC or police officer, but rather they should be held uh, accountable. There should be a trial. And uh, the only way that they will be able to enforce writ of a state, a state shouldn't have any ideology if a person who is a police in army or any other he should not look into things from his faith uh, uh, side, neither from his ethnic side. He should be responsible to enforce only law. And that is the only way uh, that uh, they can uh, uh, reinforce anything. I think that uh, the due process, everything are interconnected. We look into rule of law and rule of law is only possible with a strong democracy. democracy means no one should be discriminated. Everyone should come according to their, uh, you know, support of the masses. So it's a, again utopian approach, but I still believe that uh, only people, only uh, the people who have some rationality can still bear some hope in the country and they can change it somehow. Thank you, Jalila. Thank you. That is Thank you so much. And I, I guess no um, quick solutions, perhaps, but a, a system of education and, uh, and the culture of re-education. Um, I have a, 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 an observation and question from uh, a, a member of the executive committee of uh, the BHRC uh, and a, a member of my chambers, Doughty Street Chambers, is Sweeney Viratna Casey, who uh, says, um, thank you very much, um, for the powerful and shocking accounts of your experiences, which echo around the region. So I think Aswini is referring to other countries that have similar problems um, cl close to Pakistan. Thank you for your bravery. To what extent does the state seek refuge or justification for its actions in, the, in their activities based on what their regional neighbors are doing? So China is doing X or Sri Lanka's the X is happening. So, um, so it's not so strange that we might do it, um, or in fact, it's a justification. Um, it, so we're really looking at a, 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 a very important and, and wider uh, part of this th this topic. Um, does anyone want to come in first? Jalila? 
I think our state, that is the problem with our state that they never take the responsibility, whatever is happening inside, they always put burden on China to India to some neighboring countries. And they never say that, yes, it is our, it was our responsibility. There is no acceptance of any uh, mistake. And in, since last 75 years, we are still looking that someone at least come and accept their faults and say that it was a mistake, the laws we introduced was a mistake, the private Lashkars or armies like Lashkari Jangli and TLP and uh, uh, other things that we have established like uh, Taliban and others, it was our mistakes. No one is going to accept it. And there is that if they are not accepting it, so there is no solution. That is why we are still expecting, we are still hoping Think that they sh someone should come and take this responsibility. It is they are ruling our country, our politicians, our judiciary, our uh, law enforcing agencies. So executive, all these should come and take responsibility that it is our country and protection and dignity and life of its citizen is our responsibility. So. Again, only democracy, democracy, a true democracy is the solution. I don't have any other hope. And the political solution. Thank you, Jalila. Um, and Saif, um, if you uh, um, uh, unmute yourself, please. Um, I've been asked a question uh, marked anonymous. Um, have you found safe um, um, support within the EU, the United Nations or other international bodies um, on the application of these draconian laws, uh, for example, resolutions that might might have been passed. What, what support have you had? Uh, and I know Rim Shamasi's case was really high profile at one point and everybody was... Oh, you know, I, I have only few friends in EU, members of the European Parliament. Rest, uh, I'm not working as NGO. I'm a simple lawyer. I don't know how to work with... UN and blah, blah, blah. I'm just uh, working on whenever a high profile blasphemy case comes, the people come to me that you do this case. Yes. So, so I'm not uh, doing this as uh, having my some organization which is working with US or working with UN or working, with, no. But as the first question which you posed that uh, government is taking refuge for Sri Lanka, blah, blah. I say no, the, that is not the now problem. Problem is that after Ziaul Haq, the mullah has gone so strong financially and uh, muscle wise and uh, with the support of the people who are poor, who don't have money to eat, the street gangsters, they've also joined the TLP. I mean, who has nothing to do with the religion. They don't go to mass, they, they're absolutely not religious. But just to enjoy the power, they've joined that party. I've seen whenever these roads are stopped and countries blocked, it is all those uh, street boys, who are having no work, having no money, having no education, no respect in the society. They're coming with the sticks in their hand and uh, breaking the cars and slip, slapping on the face of the people who are driving the car and they enjoy. With the vengeance they bring out that, well, society is not treating us. So I honestly feel that the genuine religious people who are supporting all this, they're very, very few. Rest are all those who want to enjoy power somehow, who can't abuse to anyone. But once this religious mob comes and they can beat a man in Mercedes, they can do anything and they can kill somebody and they enjoy it. And the solution is very simple. The day state goes serious. They just have to make one statement. You know, once 
this uh, TLP, they have uh, stopped the whole country. It was fourth day when the uh, inter services public army spokesman came on the television. He said, well, we give you three o'clock noon time to vacate the road. Otherwise, law will take its own course. After his speech, in one hour, whole Pakistan roads were uh, cleared. So that means a strong message from the strong institution, mm. not from the prime minister, from the chief of army staff, that well, anybody who takes law into your own hands, in any case, maybe it's a blasphemy, maybe it's uh, Ahmadi, maybe whatever the situation is. Nobody is allowed to be above the law and take law into their own hands. Unless the state stands on his feet with such a strength, there's no solution. And if they don't stand, then day by day, the power will be shifting more and more to these people, more and more to these people. And one day they'll become so strong that even state will think to correct it, then it will be more difficult than today. Thank you very much, Saif. Um, Farooq, um, if I can ask you this, uh, we've had some discussion on um, when international uh, uh, help um, uh, is appropriate and when it's less appropriate. Um, in respect of the, the work you do, uh, and if I think about the Bar Human Rights Committee, we've done amicus curie interventions, trial observations, and uh, have a lot of knowledge of using UN mechanisms as well. To what extent uh, in the plight of the Ahmadiyya community is that sort of assistance helpful? Yeah, I mean, it's helpful to a limited extent. For example, recently Pakistan had a universal periodic review last month, so that will be a barometer on its human rights, where it is and its violations. There's also, I think, about GSP Plus, which is a powerful tool from the EU, which is general system for professional preferential trade. So where Pakistan gets better trade rates. That did cause an issue and there was some movement a year ago. And I think working with the EU and others, there can be some movement. It's not gonna, in our opinion, remove the blasphemy law, but like I said, if we go step by step, small steps, I know my co-panelists have said it should come from Pakistan. I agree, but at the same time, we should use everything available. I think the international community can also play its part, particularly through the EU, through the GSP plus without affecting the, the citizens of Pakistan. So it's mm -hmm. actually hit, so the hit is on the authorities. I think that that is one way and uh, that can happen or focusing on rights of citizenship. The UN mechanisms like if you use UPR are good in terms of documenting, recording. Also, you've got the faithful rights using religious mechanisms that religion is used as a tool for rem or removing any form of persecution or dealing with persecution or discrimination. So th there, are, there are some tools available there, but I think the most powerful tool would be um, through the EU, which does have some influence. And I think GSP would be, would be a, a way forward. But again, it, what we need is collective working together on the ground with all minorities and groups, because then we're more stronger and the voice is amplified rather than people working individually. Yes. Thank you, Farouk. And I, and I do remember um, a couple of years ago, myself and uh, Helena Kennedy um, from, from, from Doughty Street discussing this with the uh, newly appointed um, uh, EU ambassador to Pakistan, who, who very much saw this part of the solution um, uh, uh, being funding linked to progression of, 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 of human rights. I mean, one thing um, I forgot to add, Zibin, was that education is a big sector. And I know the Foreign Office, or the FCDO as it's called now, and even the US and others, are now channeling that funding to ensure that hate material is removed against Christians, Ahmadis, and others. That's another area which could bring some small change if, if it's done strategically and with some focus. Thank you, Farouk. 
Um, Jalila, in one of our recent events that we had, very similar to, to this one, an online event, we welcomed a renowned Pakistani human rights defender, Nikar Dad, who shared with us the gendered, um, the gendered dimension of the abuse of human rights defenders in Pakistan. So my question is, what can be done to support female human rights defenders working um, as lawyers or as NGOs in the civil space? Uh, is enough being done to protect them and what more can can we do to help? Uh, well, uh, I agree with Nigat. Like there are uh, uh, too much backlash, mm. hate, and harassment uh, uh, against the human rights defenders. Uh, I I know Nigat is one of the victims of this, uh, including the journalists, female journalists who have an opinion they face too much uh, abuse. I think it is uh, the solution is uh, a, an international solidarity from uh, uh, so sister solidarity and as well as solidarity from our male allies that join hands and support us in this situation. I think there is another technical issue with the online harassments as well, like there uh, are so many barriers in the reporting of the harassments and the uh, rules. Uh, for instance, if I complain to cybercrime that something has happened to me, uh, before uh, they uh, go for the culprits, they will ask my devices for the verification. So in these situations, my data will get compromised and uh, many other issues uh, that the human rights defenders who are already victim of uh, uh, harassment and vulnerability, they again go through the same process. So these all are very, you know, red tape procedures. And uh, yes, uh, I think we need a strong international solidarity for the from both sisters, from both uh, from our male allies, as well as um, under G as uh, Farooq mentioned, GSP plus, there are terms and condition for the uh, women uh, such, uh, conditions for the women rights as well in this. However, they have not specifically mm -hmm. mentioned the women human rights uh, defenders. I think it should be considered in the next GSP plus or UPR reporting because all these will uh, at least uh, our state will try to redress human rights defenders issues, uh, especially women human rights uh, defenders issues. So it is, I don't look at uh, in an isolated situation. However, I see that it can be uh, built on uh, some international solidarity uh, of sisterhood and uh, male allies. Thank, thank you, Jalila. Um, I'd like to invite each of our speakers now um, to contribute a, a last thought um, uh, or recommendation that addresses the question of how we can all as lawyers and human rights defenders support activists, lawyers and journalists and ordinary citizens in Pakistan. What can we do to help protect human rights and the rule of law? Um, this has been a difficult subject, but um, we, if we think positively about what we can do together and uh, taking the lead from what Jalila just said about solidarity. Um, so Jalila, do you want to start? Uh, I am a lawyer and I'm a human rights defender as well. And I'm really in a scary situation. Uh, I, I, I feel in these scary situations. So what we can offer to each other is to take up the cases of each other on free cases, share the mental health, you know, uh, human rights defenders, they go through so much mental health uh, uh, pressures, insecurities. So uh, I think there should be a some fundings for the protection of human rights defenders in case of their vulnerability and threats. Uh, they should be taken to some safe spaces. Uh, there are some fundings, but I don't think so. It is enough for every human rights defenders in the other spaces that they raise voice. So there should be a collision fund for this. UN should uh, make this mechanism as well as EU should, can make or lawyers there should be a community of lawyers who can uh, join hands together and uh, only work for the rights of the human rights defenders, pursue their cases, 
um, check their security, all these things. So as a lawyer and human rights defender, I am talking out of my experience and I look in this uh, solution and give more voices to each other, give a backup and support to each other. That is the need of time. Thank you so, so much, Jalila. Um, and same question, if I may say to you, you've done su such incredible work, but um, you can't do it all yourself. We're here to, to help. And how, how can we best do that? I think seriously, the West can play a very, very pivotal role, like uh, issuing the nationalities, passport to us, that. Uh, are all these people who opposes us, they know they, they have a place to live. I mean, or we can, man like me, who has already crossed 67 years of age and has done all whatever was my share, all most controversial cases, Salman Tasir, Asya, Shagufta, all I have done alone. I think at least such a uh, emerged people, they should be given uh, one Western nationality or uh, the, say, your England can ask us, okay, three months, you're free. Come here, it's a free residence. We'll feed you, have good whiskeys, go around, relax, because our drinking whiskeys, three years in imprisonment in Pakistan carrying it three years in prison. So, I mean, these are really what can be done. But in my experience, all these Western world, they only talk. But when it comes to give something, in my experience of 10 years, the answer is no. If you ask them to give you some money, if you ask them to facilitate you in immigration, if you ask them the okay, our children should be given at some university to study, at least we should uh, be clear that, well, okay, we are killed, no problem. Nobody will listen. It's only sometime in a function, they, ha, 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 you are very brave, you are blah, blah, blah. Finish, go, that's all. There should be something practical. So there should be a house in uh, anywhere in England meant for this. Invite all the time, five, 10 top, whichever you think they're top ranking or doing something. Come and relax for two months, three months, get back and again fight, start fighting. I mean, this can be a very serious. It looks uh, fun, but I'm talking it uh, from a serious uh, angle. Yeah. And if I may say so, as some, some echoes uh, there with what Jalila said in terms of um, help with mental health, help with well being, being able to escape. From yeah, this the same thing. This, this is the same what I'm saying, but I'm yeah. saying with a different words. Yes, yes. Um, and Farooq, if I ask you the question, but I, I guess the question is slightly different for you because you um, are here um, as a solicitor, practicing solicitor in, 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 in London. Uh, but in terms of the plight of the Ahmadiyya community, uh, would you have any final thoughts and recommendations in terms of the assistance that, um, that we can give as lawyers? And most of the audience, the vast majority today are lawyers, and I know they'll be keen to help where they can. I think one, picking up on Jalila's point, I think we've got to focus on uh, alliances with all minorities and groups working together. You know, so you call out wrong where it, wherever it is, whether it's Christians, Hindus, Ahmadis, human rights defenders, I think then we're more stronger, whether it's within Pakistan or outside. And I think, as I've alluded to before, I think we really need to focus on, particularly with the Western or the international community, on citizenship, which seems to be more palatable to them to say, look, everyone should have equal rights. Yes, there's a, there's a strategy of working within Pakistan, but we must also work outside as well to bring, to bring everyone together. And there, there can be some intelligent, particularly from the legal side, you know, there's trial observations, as you mentioned before. We also know 
There are mechanisms like the UPR, the GSP. But I think we've got to work so that we, the vision that Jinnah said, that the, that state is founded, you know, everyone knows this. But he said, you are free, you're free to go to your temples, you're free to go to your mosques, etc. your place of worship in Pakistan. So you, it doesn't matter, you, you may belong to any religion, caste or creed, but that's nothing to do with the state. That's the aspiration. I think we all have to work towards that. It's a difficult path, but we mustn't lose hope. You know, we've got to remain optimistic. Human rights work is like this. But I think the more alliances and, and networks we build, that will certainly help going forward. Now, I, I said that was the, 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 the final thought, Farouk, but I, I do have one thing I wanted to uh, add before, before we finish um, today. Um, we use the word human rights activists and, and defenders um, sometimes quite loosely, but you guys very much are on the front line. Uh, you are extremely brave, and I, I, I don't just pay lip service to that. And um, all three of you individually, I know Safe, um, I had the privilege to spend a lot of time with you in Lahore, and it's um, I know the very real threat you are under every single day. At something your life is under threat, and something could 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 happen to you equally. Um, Farouk, I know the Emadiya community um, is probably the most vulnerable uh, and the one with the least attention on it. Um, and um, Jalila, there, there are stories that we know um, that, that you've gone through that I won't, I won't share publicly, but uh, it's not lost on me that uh, that uh, you are somebody who's not just been arrested twice, but intimidated in all sorts of, 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 of unseen ways. So my question is, why do you still do it? Um, say if you don't have, you, you could stop now. Why do you still do this? Yeah, you asked uh, England to call me as a retired person. Let me make a research. Have the have the whiskey on ice. Then what about you, Jalila? Yeah. Why 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 do you do the work you do in Balochistan? Sorry, Jalila, you're on a mute. So in Balochistan, I have to behave well because I should pretend to be a good lady, you know, a good uh, Isadar, dignified lady. So <laughs> I, I am beyond the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, I, I just do nothing. I spend time inside my house. I don't socialize. After my court hours, I don't trust people anymore. I feel so scared of the people. That is a very, I'm sharing very honest thing. So I cook and clean the house and just do gardening. It's, it's something that, yeah. We have to pay a few things because being courageous is not easy thing. We have to sacrifice so many things for this. Thank you, um, Jillian. Nothing, nothing wrong with, with, with gardening. Um, yeah. And Farouk, do you have um, any final thoughts that you'd like to add? And you know, quite, I know many people will be interested in what, what motivates you to do what you do. I think quite simply what, what motivates me is, um, I mean, I'm a Muslim and my religion is Islam and these people are hijacking it. At the heart of Islam is choice, freedom of choice for everyone, the freedom to disagree, the freedom to do what, you you know, uh, you know, for, have different religions, go to your mosque. The Quran actually says you protect those people. So that, at the word, that's my uh, motivation to ensure that the right message and the true Islam is displayed, which has been hijacked by the, these countries or these people. And this is what we need to do to educate each other. And also uh, it's humanity at the end of the day, because Islam teaches us all to serve humanity, irrespective of your faith or no faith. Thank you so much, Farouk. Um, if anyone ever tells you that South Asians can't stick to a schedule when speaking, then please refer them to today's session, because I think we are, we're absolutely on track. And in the last minute that we have, I just want to say, um, on you know, you know Thank you very much, first of all, for those closing remarks. Um, and I want to conclude by thanking the panel um, today who have taken out time from very, very busy schedules, spoken about things which could potentially have repercussions for them. Um, and I know that's not very, uh, it, 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 it's not easy to, to talk about these things, especially I'm thinking about Saif and Jinnah, who are who speaking from, um, from, from obviously Balochistan. And, and Punjab. Um, so our warmest, warmest, warmest thanks from the Bar Human Rights Committee to, to all three of you, and indeed on, from all the people listening, I know 
they, they will echo that too. Thank you so much to our audience for participating and um, for all the amazing questions uh, 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 and penetrating questions that we've had. And uh, it's been a really, really eye-opening and um, candid, um, chilling uh, uh, talk, but lots of positives as well that I hope can uh, continue to come out of it. Um, so I look forward to seeing um, everybody again, including especially all our audience, please stay um, tuned in for uh, uh, news about the upcoming events on Myanmar and Bangladesh. And we hope to bring those to you um, as, as soon as uh, 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 they're ready and hope to welcome you back for the next event on, on our diminishing uh, democracy panel series. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Saves. Thank you, Farouk. Thank you, Jalila. Thank you. Thanks.